Oh, hi. I didn't see you over there. Uh, before we roll this week's episode, a quick heads up. Do you know Flickr? Remember Flickr? Flickr is coming out swinging with a bold new ad campaign right in Instagram's front yard, and it's called Photography Doesn't Need Instagram. Bold move, Flickr. Bold move. Their basic message is simple. Photography doesn't need annoying ads, influencer strategies, or your data. It's a place for photographers to share their images, be inspired, and connect with the un disputed world's largest photography community. And let's be real, Flickr is the OG, or the original gangster, of photography. They've been around since 2006, and the Twib Flickr group, I started that back in 2008, and it's still going strong. And today the group has over 14,000 members who've uploaded almost a half million images. So if you haven't checked out Flickr lately, you should give them another look, and you can start that revised journey by diving into the Twib Flickr group at twip.pro slash flicker. See you over there. Hey folks, in this episode, I get to sit down with my friend, Mr. Jay Blakesburg. We're gonna be talking about film and a brand new book that he's just released. This is Twitter. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, like I said in that little intro there, I get to sit down with Mr. Jay Blakesburg. Jay is a, he's a storied photographer. You'll understand why when we start showing some of the photos that he has produced, but he's a rock star photographer or a photographer who happens to photograph rock stars and have has access at that level to get uh, some iconic shots that have been on the timeline of all of our lives, you know, so now I get to sit down and chat with this man and kind of get into his brain specifically uh, in this interview because I've had Jay on before and I'll link to I'll embed that that episode in the blog post for this episode. But uh, that one was kind of a getting to know Jay. This one, I want to talk about that book that he has uh, that's out. And I also want to talk about uh, film and kind of get his thoughts on the world of film and where it was, where it is today, and more importantly, where it's going. So Jay Blakesburg, welcome to This Week in Photo, man. How are you doing? Thanks, Frederick. Good to see you again. Been a while. Pre-pandemic, I think, is the last time we chatted. The world was a little different last time you and I sat across cameras from each other, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, we, we roll with the punches and here we are and the camera keeps on clicking. Right? Yeah. So, so let's yeah. let's talk about film, you know, because you yeah. brought that up. Um, you know, I have not shot with film since 2008, not a single frame. And uh, and I don't see myself going back. My daughter, on the other hand, she only shoots on film. And, uh, you know, when I was a film shooter, what was in interesting and intriguing to me, you know, in hindsight, one of the things, I guess, is that um, – we had many flavors of film. You had black and white, you had color, you had high speed, slow speed, high grain, tight grain. Um, uh, and then you could process it different ways. You could push your film, you could pull your film, you could cross process your film. You could shoot tungsten film in daylight and get blue images, or you could shoot daylight film in a tungsten thing and get yellow images intentionally, right? And then also you could shoot in 35 millimeter or two and a quarter or six by seven or four by five or eight by 10 or half frame or uh, wide, wide lux panoramic or with toy cameras or half frame cameras. So, and you had, you know, all these different lenses. And then all of a sudden we start shooting digital. We all have the same cameras with the same three lenses and the same sensors and the same software. Right. Yep, yep. And so, so, you know, from a film to digital perspective at the beginning of that, I hated the transition because I felt so limited creatively by what was in front of me with the digital camera. And I look at my early digital photos and I was a Nikon guy, so I never made the switch to Canon, which was way ahead of the game in the early days of digital. You know, and I look at some of these files and they're, you know, three, two, three, four megabyte photos. We didn't understand raw capture just yet. We didn't understand file size, resolution, sensor size, full frame versus, you know, at the very, very beginning, it was all just new gibberish to somebody like me who started shooting film in 1978. Uh, and so, you know, 40 years later, I'm like, hmm, okay, you know, what, what, what do I do? How do I do this? Um, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And so there was a big learning curve in there. 
And uh, nowadays with the film world, you know, the other thing that we had at our disposal is we had all these great film labs, right? You, they were your friends. They were your partners. You brought them this precious raw film that had um, light embedded in this celluloid and, and they put it in these chemicals and gave it back to you. And it was beautiful photographs, right? And so those labs are no longer here. So you're limited to how you can even process your your stuff. I remember, do you remember that story four, eight, 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago? I don't even remember when it was. When that, uh, when, when it was it Steve McCurry who developed the last roll of Kodachrome? I can't remember, it was some famous National Geographic type person, you know, process the final role of Kodachrome. And uh, do you remember that new story? No, um, I don't. I don't remember that. How'd that go? Uh, I'm sure you can find it on the internet. I'm sure if you just do a little, you know, the, the, the last role of Kodachrome. Yeah. And it was like a big deal. I mean, but, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but, uh, you know, back in the 90s, well, the pre-90s, the only place you could get your Kodachrome process was at Kodak, get a mail away or bring it to a photo lab and they mailed it away or put it in pouches, whatever. And then in the 90s, uh, Kodak licensed the chemistry and technology to process Kodachrome to a, like six or eight labs around the country. And one of them was the new lab in San Francisco where all the pros went to develop their slide film, their chrome film here in San Francisco. And all of a sudden... Um, you know, we had Kodachrome 64 and then they put out Kodachrome 200. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you know, we're a little over a stop brighter than where we were. Um, and because you were custom processing your Chrome film, you could actually push it two stops to, to 800. So all of a sudden you had 800 speed Kodachrome, right? And so there were all these things that were in place between film, camera, film processing labs, whether it was black and white or color, C41 or E6, um, and all of those things are gone. And so for me, in terms of my workflow and how I'm creating and how quickly people want my stuff now, it's kind of hard for me to, to put film back in my workflow. I think if I was quote unquote retired as a shooter, I could figure out a way to put, um, film back into my workflow. I still have all my cameras. I still have my Hasselblad. I still have my four by five camera. Uh, but I just, you know, the way I am now, because I still do shoot and I still do commercial gigs, um, people want, they want us to shoot digitally. They don't want us to shoot film. And uh, uh, I'm sure there are, are partners or, or clients out there that would accept that and be willing to do that. And then you get into the whole next level. So early on, when I made the transition to digital, I was shooting with these very low end Nikon digital cameras, I'll call them, you know, these, these, you know, D whatever they were, I don't even remember at the time, 70, 50, 30, I don't know. Um, they sucked, whatever they were, they were not very good. Um, uh, I also shot a lot of my big jobs on film, but I delivered them to my clients digitally. So we built a digital studio early on where I had a full-time guy in here and he was scanning stuff on flatbed scanners. And then Nikon came out with the first uh, cool scan 200 or 400, I think it was the 200. Um, also, a, you know, compared to what we scanned with today, a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look at the scans that I did on that scanner and anything that ever wants to get used by anybody has to be rescanned. And, you know, when I moved on to the 400 and then the 800 Nikon, which did two and a quarter, uh, but it had its limitations because it was a, a hard plastic film holder and it tried to keep your film flat. And then eventually uh, Imicon came out with the flex tight scanners, which eventually were bought by Hasselblad. And they're the ones that go into the scanner and they curve. And so it keeps your film taut end to end for a, uh, a sharp scan edge to edge. And that's what we still scan with today. But, yeah. you know, it's scary because those Imicon slash Hasselblad scanners are Firewire 400, and they're only supported up to operating systems on computers that are eight years old now. So we have an iMac that with an old operating system on it uh, that I only bought maybe five, six years ago, but it's got an older system. I don't even know which one. We can't update that system because otherwise the scanners would no longer work. Oh, and so, uh, you know, so, so, and, and nobody's come out with a replacement since Hasselblad you know, stop making these scanners. So now you have uh, a lot of cheap Epson scanners and five, six, eight, nine hundred dollar scanners. And yeah, you could do a big scan. It'll give you a 200 megabyte file, 
but it's got no detail in your highlights. It's got no detail in your shadows. It's nowhere near as sharp as what the Hasselblad is doing. And so, you know, we are getting close to the end of the time where we can actually even scan film on a high level, unless you go out to somebody who has a drum scanner, which now you're talking about 25, 35, 50, 80 thousand dollars to purchase that equipment. Untenable. Or, yeah, nobody's going to do that. Yeah. yeah but, but, or, uh, how do you do that though? Like, what's your solution? You you got a, a I'm guessing a vault full of you know irreplaceable shots on celluloid, right? So yeah. is it yeah. is it? Is it that you just got to set aside a good three months and get it all scanned in with modern equipment and then chuck that on iMac? <laughs> okay, three, three years. Three years. <laughs> we, we've, been, we've been scanning my film archive on the Hasselblad and Imicon scanners now for 17 years, what? 18 years. I think we've got roughly... Uh, we've got roughly 70 or 80,000 pieces of film scanned. Uh, we're still going back and rescanning a lot of things. Uh, early on, hard drives were still very expensive and storage was expensive. And so even though we were scanning TIFFs, we weren't scanning them full size. We we're scanning them at like 18 inches, 16 inches, you know, and now people want to buy prints that are 30 by 40 or 40 by 50, or, you know, you need bigger scans for bigger things. And so, uh, you know, like my museum exhibit that's coming up, right. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, yeah. I'm making they're 30 by 40 and and, and uh, 36 by 36. And so we're going back and we're finding these old school Imicon scans that are 14 inches and they need to be 36 inches, right? So we're going back and we're rescanning stuff. And so uh, during the pandemic, we did a lot of scanning, but uh, I've got a guy in here, Chris, full-time guy, and he scans every single day. Um, he is scanning. What's the time? Was it, what's the, how many can he get done in a day? In a really good day when he does have a lot of other distractions uh, with other stuff, whether it's, you know, commercial work that needs to be put out, retouching, printing, digital management, other stuff that he's doing, he can do 30 to 35 a day, something like that. Um, on a really good day, he might hit 40, but that's not common. It's probably between 30 and 35 images a day. And that's him just really being concentrated on, you know, every time that scanner stops, he's pulling it out, moving on to the next one. But like if he's on a deadline doing something else, you know, he might be working on a. He's not going to just break away from retouching something or doing some other project to go, OK, I got to change the scan. It'll, you know, the scan will go through it. It'll sit there at the edge of the scanner after it gets spit out for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Right. And then all of a sudden you've lost four new scans or five yeah. new scans. Yeah or whatever it is, you know? So uh, he is he is scanning nonstop, and he's, he's scanning my work, but he's also scanning all of these other um, archival collections that we are working with right now. My daughter and I have a new business called Retro Photo Archive. You can find that at www.retrophotoarchive.com. And uh, we are working with a bunch of uh, photographers who have either passed away with their estates or they're elderly photographers and they want us to manage their work and we're going in and scanning their stuff as well. So we have a nonstop, nonstop production line going of scanning uh, different people's work. Um, you know, so, uh, so, terminal suffice, so, suffice it to say you are not generating any new film work, right? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I have not shot any film since 2008. Wow. Uh, the, wow. About uh, September, uh, I thought I my last role was in August, but I just found another role from September. September of two thousand eight, I believe, is the last time I shot film. Uh, but you know, on the other hand, we've shot one point eight million digital files, you know, wow. and and, wow. and it's an enormous amount of storage, and so. And you what know, are you like, shooting, Jay? What are, what are you shooting? Are you still Nikon, or did you? I'm did Nikon D eight fifty guy. So they're you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been thinking about going mirrorless and the Z9 and whatnot, but I'm just, I decided I'm going to wait another two years. I actually just bought a, 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 an extra D850 from a friend of mine who hadn't used it in a while. It's funny. He's like, hey, there's, there's 5,000 shutter activations on this. And I'm like, that's fine. And I, I went out and shot something uh, last week in Colorado one night and I did 3,000 shots. You in know, one so, night. <laughs> one night, you know? And so... 
uh, uh, so 5,000 shutter activations is, is nothing. So, but I needed my 850s to last a little bit longer. I have two, so now I have three. And I'll keep that going, and 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 by then it, I'm sure they'll be getting ready to come out with a new, the next version after a Z9, or the Z9 will be updated and souped up, and I'll I'll go in that direction, but uh, just not yet. Um, it's a big it's a big money hit, also. You know, even if I were to sell all my gear and buy all new lenses and two bodies and whatever, I'm looking at you know twenty five thousand dollars, I guess maybe more. You know, because yeah. I like prime lenses and zoom lenses. Uh, and you know, so I'm just, I'm just not quite ready to go down that road, uh, with Nikon, but I'm getting closer and I will do it because it has to be done. I get it. Yeah. You know, we can shoot a job on our Hasselblad that we bought 50 years ago today, but we can't shoot a job on our Nikon digital camera that we bought 15 years ago. That's true. Uh, that is know, true. So. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing about film, right? The longevity of film, right? So mm -hmm. sure. All these advances in you know, uh, focusing speeds and all this stuff, like with the Z9 you mentioned, it's like crazy, right? You can do all this crazy stuff. But, you know, what if you just want full on manual? Like, what if you just want, what if you just want the, the exposure triangle, f-stop, shutter speed, ISO, and my film in there, and I'm going to town, you know, and I can shoot. Do you ever lust for those old days of anymore. the restriction of 36 exposures and all that? <laughs> I don't. I used to early on in the transition I did, but I don't anymore. Uh, I'm a heavy shooter. I was a heavy film shooter. I always shot. I always overshot everything I did. You know, my philosophy was, okay, I'm in the Fillmore in San Francisco with the Foo Fighters in 1996. I'm never going to be in the Fillmore with the Foo Fighters in, on that day in 1996 again. So if I can shoot 10 or 15 rolls of film in a half an hour or three songs or whatever they give me, I'm going to do it. And I'm glad I did because now 30 years later, I look back and I'm like, okay, I don't have just eight frames. I've got eight rolls. And, uh, and that's, it's valuable. It's valuable as, as IP. It's valuable as a historical document of a time and a place. And uh, so on the digital thing, I'm even way more out of control. I mean, like I said, I shot 3,000 shots at a concert at Red Rocks uh, uh, last week. You know, what if that was in 36 roll, you know, uh, uh, canisters, what would that be? 90 rolls of film, you know, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, that's a, I mean, I would never shoot 90 rolls of film in one night at a concert. I might shoot nine or 10 or 20, you know, if it was a, uh, shooting a whole show. Like I remember, I think I shot like a Crosby, Sills, Nash and Young tour in 2000. And in one night, I think I shot about 25 or 30 rolls of film. Um, that was a lot back then, but, um, you know, digital, I'm just, I'm trigger happy. I'm out of control. I'm trying things, <laughs> playing with exposure. But I also am a manual shooter, even with my digital camera in terms of exposure. I was going to uh, ask that. Are you with all uh, that? With all that I mean, tech, I'm, you're still I'm, I'm auto focus, hundred percent auto focus. Yeah, yeah. I'm fully manual, and I'm not using any of the internal uh, uh, exposure um stuff that is available in these cameras because that's not how my mind works i mean my nikon d850 is really a direct extension of my hand and my brain and i can make adjustments and and correct things you know as quickly as as i need to um and maybe i'm wrong maybe because i'm old school and i'm 60 years old and i'm not a 25 year old kid that you know was born with a cell phone as a pacifier uh, <laughs> uh, you know i don't i don't think that way but i know that the z9 and probably even the d850 is smarter than i am but it works for me i mean i can make changes to shutter speed aperture and iso you know and and color temperature you know i can make decisions incredibly fast yeah. um that, that are you know maybe not as fast as what the computers and those cameras are doing but they're probably more accurate for what I'm seeing and what I'm doing and for the lighting situation that I'm in front of, especially if you're shooting a concert where the things are changing so rapidly in, in all of those arenas, you know, the triangle and adding the fourth one color temperature. Yeah. Uh, so, but do you, you know, feel, do you, you feel like you're like, is that, what's the best way to phrase this question? So photographers today, right? Like the, the photographers are born with a, with a mobile phone as a pacifier, you know, like you say, so those photographers, do you think they're missing out on a crucial sort of building block in their knowledge as an image creator by not understanding f-stop ISO, you know, shutter speed? Or 
Is it like, yeah, I don't know how to feed a horse either, but I can still get from point A to point B. Like, where do you, where do you fall? Well, on that? There's two questions, two answers in there. Um, are they missing out? They've missed out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because they missed out because they've never been in a dark room. They've never, right. You know, back, back in the day, we, you know, had to expose film, get it developed, evaluate it, figure out what we did wrong under the lighting conditions that we were just in, if we can even remember, I'm figuring out how to do it right the next time. Now you can just look at the back of your, your screen. I would say that any great photographer, any really good working photographer today, 100% knows the triangle, you know, because there's no other way to be creative unless you understand that, right? You're just a yeah. technician if you're just relying on, on, you know, auto settings and things like that, right? So it's a combination of, like, like I said, those four elements, right? Uh, uh, exposure, you know, shutter speed, aperture, ISO, um, uh, color temperature. But on top of that is is lenses, right? So if you, you know, are you going to get away with shooting at 1.8? And what's the reason that you're shooting at 1.8 or 2.0 or 2.2, right? Do you understand about depth of field? And do you understand why you're shooting at a, at a shallow depth of field? Um, not just because it's telling you to do that in order to get the correct exposure, but are you doing that in order to be creative, right? right so, right. so the best photographers and filmmakers uh, are the people that um, that uh, understand all of those things technically, but use them creatively, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, and so, you know, I had an intern a number of years ago. It's got to be at least ten years now. And, 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 you know, he didn't know, you know, he didn't know who Irving Penn was. He didn't know who Richard Avedon mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. He didn't know who, um, uh, you know, he didn't have, you know, Car Car you know, Carte Brisson, like any of these mm -hmm. people, there was no, there was no reference point. There was no um, understanding of the history of photography. Right. And I just don't feel like you can get from point A to point B without even understanding that. So there's that whole side of that question you asked me. Right. Getting yeah. from point A to point B is the, the history and understanding, because by understanding and knowing that body of work and those bodies of work, um, that is where you get your inspiration from. OK. Yeah, and without that, right. you know, like, yeah, you can get your inspiration by looking at a, a cell phone screen or or a computer screen or Instagram or Facebook or whatever, to, you know, whatever your your sources, your digital sources. But you're not in, you're not you're not absorbing it the way that we did when we went out and picked up a coffee table book of, you know, of Irving Penn or Avedon or, you know, in the American West or passages or any of these, you know, David Bailey or, or, you know, um, uh, you know, any of the great, great photographers, you know, Maple Thorpe. I mean, the list goes on and on. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. if you're a photographer, Winograd and, you know, Friedlander and all of those people. So without having all of those different points of reference and then without having ever been in a dark room, and without ever having to shot film and have to understand how you need those skills to correctly expose your film, because we shot on slide film, which had like this much latitude, right? A negative film later on color and black and white, a little, little bit more latitude. Um, without all of that information, um, they've already missed out. Now that's not to say yeah. they, can't be, they can't still be a brilliant photographer, but I still think that there's something missing there that would get them there sooner and make them understand. And I'm not saying that we're great or we're special or we're unique because we grew up with film and we grew up with those artists and Robert Frank and blah, 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 and this and that and the other thing. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, I think it would benefit those people to go back and look at that, those bodies of work for inspiration more than anything else, just for mm -hmm. the inspiration as opposed to looking on a computer screen and if you're a young up and coming concert photographer, that's great that you look at Jay Blakesburg's work, you look at my work and you're inspired yeah. by it. But I think that your level of inspiration, which will then fuel your passion, will exponentially grow to the point where it will help you grow as a photographer and become a, a better, more creative individual, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's like you, know, you got to know you got to know where you've been to understand where you're going. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's that, that, yeah. that foundational stuff there. You know, Jay, I want to I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about this gallery show that that is happening. Tell me about that. You got to be sure. you got to be. So, um, uh, I am doing my first solo museum exhibition. 
Uh, it opens October 14th, 2022, and closes February 5th, 2023. And it's at the Morris Museum in Morristown, New Jersey. And the Morris Museum is actually the only Smithsonian affiliate museum in the state of New Jersey. And so rock and roll is coming to a Smithsonian affiliate. And, uh, uh, you know, this is the real deal. And, and uh, they, they reached out to me pre-pandemic. And then we, had, you know, got caught in a big mess of the pandemic and they're also a year or two out anyway and uh, the curator said put on your calendar to call me in january of 2022 mm -hmm. and uh and i just january 2022 came and went and um and i didn't i didn't um uh email him i was sort of just waiting yeah. uh, and then um um sorry about the phone ringing somebody will hopefully pick it up um and uh, anyway, so uh, he emailed me the first week in February and said, hey, we're interested in doing that exhibit with you. Are you still interested? And we just got on a phone and we had a big call with all of their museum people. And it's uh, it's a, like a, it's a career retrospective. It's called Retro Blakesburg Captured on Film 1978-2008. So it's still just a 30 year thing. Only images shot on film. Uh, everything in the exhibit we're printing on Chromalux metal. Um, oh, you know, wow. we get all in metal. Um, there's a lab here in the Bay Area called Magnachrome, and they were one of the original sort of first labs to start doing that dye sub metal transfer. You've seen metal prints, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, Chromalux is, is helping us out, and uh, uh, their metal is beautiful, and, and uh, the way Magnachrome prints them and, and, and frames them on the back, it's a really great presentation. And uh, it's about 126 prints, I think, 125, 126 prints, four galleries. Uh, there's an intro gallery, which is early work, high school, ephemera, college, learning my place in the script, figuring out how to be a photographer. And then there's a room that's just live concert photography. There's a room that's just portrait photography of mu musicians. And then there's a room that's just Grateful Dead uh, because nice. I'm known for a lot of my Grateful Dead work. And so... Um, that's the exhibit and it, and it, and it follows along with the book, although there is stuff in the exhibit that's not in the book, um, only because we just chose different things, but it's the same, uh, the same, the same pathway, right? So the book is called Retro Blakesburg Volume One, the film archives. And that came about during the pandemic. My daughter, who's 26 years old, um, her name is Ricky. She came to me and said, Hey dad, I want to do a new Instagram page for you called Retro Blakesburg that is just based completely on your film photographs. And she thought I was going to say no. And I was like, I like that idea. And so she does that page by herself. She curates it. I have no say in the matter, um, except for I help her with some of the captions and historical information. Uh, but she chooses what goes on Retro Blakesburg. I have my own Instagram, which is Jay Blakesburg, and I post everything, old stuff, new stuff, yesterday stuff. Uh, marketing stuff for projects that I've going on, the museum thing or speaking gigs that I'm doing. And uh, uh, so what you're looking at there is the uh, forward who is written by Wayne Coyne, who's the lead singer of a band called The Flaming Lips. And so Wayne and I have a 30 plus year relationship of photographing him. That shot up top, they were shot in 1994. And uh, Wayne wrote a great forward. If you keep scrolling, you can keep cruising there. Um, uh, a guy named Michael Franti, who was in a band called Spearhead. He wrote the introduction. So that photo on the left is a picture of a deadhead in 1979 that I took when I was 18. On the right are the Hells Angels uh, in Golden Gate Park in 1987. And then this is a short essay that my daughter wrote about creating this book with me. She curated the whole book. Um, so she chose everything. I had no say again, I, there was one or two photos that I fought for, but out of the 312 pages, she decided on on every single photo except for maybe two or three. So that's my daughter dancing on stage with the flaming lips when she's about eight years old. Uh, and then that's a self-portrait of me and my dad in 1981. And then that's me over in the color shot is in 1981. And then keep keep cruising here because we're, we're, I think we're running out of time here. Yeah, um, uh, so there's Snoop Dogg in 1998, I believe, and the band Primus. Where did I see this shot? I've seen this shot a million times, oh, the Snoop Dogg shot. Last time we spoke. Um, so then here, here's the first chapter is the 1970s, right? So each decade, so the book goes by decade, and each decade has like a 2,500-word essay 
that I wrote about that decade. So this is, you know, me figuring out how to become a photographer that there's a tear sheet up there. That's the first time I was ever published and paid money. Um, oh, yeah. you know, that, that one right there. Oh, is that, that your first check right there? $15, two photos in the aquarium <laughs> weekly in New Jersey. And, oh. uh, uh, you know, a press pass that I found on the ground, which was a big moment for me. And I write about these things in the book, keep, keep cruising down. So the book starts out here in the seventies. And these are all photos that I took in high school of my friends. This is us, you know, being juvenile delinquents and, and, and drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana and, and, and causing trouble and, and, you know, being typical these stoners, right. That's, that's um, quite a blunt right there. Man. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, um, you know, but back then we were the crazies, right. We were the ones who were pushing the, pushing the envelope, uh, you know, and then these are some photos that I took of musicians when I was in high school, when I was 16 and 17 years old. Um, uh, and that's where the, you know, the whole first chapter is in the seventies. So it's a combination of high school photos and photos that I took of bands, uh, when I was still in high school, like the beginning of my senior year in September of 1978, I was 16 years old. I shot Neil Young and Bob Dylan back to back two nights in a row, uh, at Madison square garden, you know, my third week of my senior year in high school. And so these are all people that are, you know, were, were around our scene and, and hanging out with us. And, and then, uh, you know, like this shot here where this guy is, is smoking pot, playing guitar in my bedroom, his name was George Allenbeal. And he would come to my bedroom with his guitar and his amp and just play along with the records. And there's a joint inside that little plastic bottle in backwards and it filled up with smoke. And then you squeeze the smoke <laughs> out and it's called the power hitter. Now uh, on the text there underneath is a little th uh, asterisk that says C notes. And so in the back of the book, there's an extended caption about this particular photo. And the caption is kind of a sad one because George, he was a year or two older than me in high school. Uh, post high school, he was flying from uh, Minneapolis back to New Jersey on a commercial Northwest Airlines flight that crashed and he was killed. You know, yeah. 200 people killed on a plane kind of a thing, like one of those random things. So throughout the book, there are extended captions. And then as you get into the 80s, I go to college and I talk about, you know, figuring out my next place in the script. And then I graduate from college and I move to the Bay Area. And I'm trying to figure out like, you know, how do I how do I take pictures and actually make a living? So there's Pete Townsend from The Who and Crosby, Stills and Nash. And there's a self portrait of me and my friends in high school. And um, you know, this is like suburban New Jersey in the 1970s, right? Late and this is all this is all curated by your daughter, and she put all, all these together. By my daughter, and 100%. all shot on film, everything, right? Everything of shot on film, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know, some stuff in the classrooms, on the bleachers, at football games. Uh, Eric Clapton and the Allman Brothers and the Rolling Stones, and um, so keep cruising. Let's do a big chunk because I know we're down to our last five minutes or so. So here's the 1980s yeah. where I talked. Out, you know what was going on with me and some newspaper clippings and and uh you know that newspaper clipping there is the newspaper clipping about me getting arrested for drugs in 1981 oh. and I, I won't go into any more detail so you can go buy the book and you can learn all about it but this yeah. is me as a deadhead taking pictures of deadheads on tour and following the grateful dead and uh eventually i moved to the pacific northwest and look at this college. look at this shot right here it's amazing how some things never change right <laughs> Nobody for president, 1980. And uh, and uh, you guys don't have to be afraid of me being a, a, an a, a arrested, convicted felon for getting arrested with drugs. It was, you know, it was nothing that any of us weren't doing in the 1970s. Nowadays, yeah. nowadays would be different. Um, and Ooh, so, you know, yeah, some mushrooms, you know, I mean, this is this is what my daughter found interesting. Here's some pictures of the Grateful Dead and some deadheads and uh um, you know, so it, this is me developing, you know, my style and my look and my feel and who I am as a photographer. This is and, Golden Gate uh, Park right here, right? Is this Golden Gate uh, Park? That's, actually, that's down in Monterey. Uh, oh, at a okay. dead, there, are some, there is some stuff in, in, from Golden Gate Park um, for sure. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Led Zeppelin. Um, you know, so again, this is like me just in the, you know, by the time I moved to California, uh, by 87, I do my first assignment for Rolling Stone magazine, November 11th, 1987. I shoot the band U2 doing a free concert in downtown San Francisco. It was what? filmed for the movie Rattle and Hum. And that's my first assignment for Rolling Stone. And then I go on to do another 300 assignments for them over the next 30 years, essentially. And uh, so this is still early work. There's Prince and The Cure. What? And the 
And uh, there's the shot of Bono from U2 spray painting with the graffiti at the free concert in downtown San Francisco. Uh, some punk rock fans and goth fans and Jane's Addiction and Soundgarden and um, uh, the replacements and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then you get to the 90s. And now I've got tear sheets of Neil Young on the cover of a magazine and, you know, uh, bigger bands and big, better access and, you know, Pearl Jam and Beck and uh, oh Ice, Ice, Ice Cube. Ice Cube, yeah. Wow. You know, and John Lee Hooker and Keith Richards and, you know, uh, Iggy Pop and Carlos Santana. So now I'm starting to shoot magazine features and shoot covers and, and bigger assignments for Rolling Stone and um, uh, Neil Young and Fish and REM and Gil Scott Heron. So, you know, there's all of these photographs that sort of track my life and where, what I was doing as a photographer. So that's why I like to call this particular book my visual autobiography because each of these decades has these extended essays and extended captions in the back of the book. And it really kind of, you know, tells you, you know, I also talk about in, in, I think it's the 2000s essay, my transition from film to digital, okay. you know, and what that meant for someone that was 40 years old and had just learned how to use a computer in the last 10 years. And I mean, we were there before there was text, text messaging, Bef you know, when, when I got my first email address, it was JB photo. And I spelled photo F O T O. Like, you don't think about that. You know, most people are thinking photo P H O T O. Like, you know, nobody can like, you know, you're thinking you're, you know, what's my clever new email address, JB photo with an F. You know, like big mistake, you, you know, like nobody can find it, right? You know, what's the, what's the internet? How, you know, how do you get on the internet? Um, uh, you know, how, do, what is this worldwide? What is Netscape? How do you download that browser so you can get on the internet? Wait, right. you have to get a modem that, that makes that funny whistling sound because it's dial up. Um, uh, you know, so there was all these technological challenges that is we that were going Courtney? to. That's Courtney, that's Courtney, Courtney, Courtney Love, right? Love Tori Amos up above him on the left the purple jacket with the knife, that's Anton LaVey, the head of the Church of Satan here in San Francisco. Whoa. Fascinating photo shoot. Um, look up the Church of Satan. It was all, it was a crazy, I don't know if it was a cult, but it was a thing to shock the public in the 60s. Um, there's Dave yeah. Grohl from the Foo Fighters and the Chili Peppers and the Ramones and Bjork and Wilco and Jane's Addiction and Santana and Patti Smith and Dr. Dre and the Beastie Boys. Right. So this is all stuff that, you know, magazines and record companies and artists were hiring me to shoot and, um, you know, did a lot of work for Rolling Stone. Jody Peckman was my photo editor for 25 years there. We did probably 250 assignments before she left the magazine and the staff took over and did maybe another 50. And, you know, rock and roll photography is it's a young person's game. You know, like I don't know who a lot of these young pop artists are like I shoot more. Um, evergreen artists. And there's the essay from the 2000s that talks mm -hmm. about, um, you know, my transition from from uh, film to digital and, and what it meant and how we did it and how it changed our workflow. And, and uh, uh, you know, it was a game changer all the way around. There's Tom Petty and Stone Temple Pilots and Paul Simon. Um, and uh, uh, look uh, at this. This is just like a time machine. Yeah. So like I said, it's my visual autobiography and uh, in words and pictures with, you know, nice, long extended captions. And uh, if you want to buy signed copies directly from me, it's just coming out now. The, the You know, we have copies in stock. I think Amazon, if they don't have them yet, they should be getting them any day now. They've already placed their big order and they're on their way. Um, uh, but, you know, if you want to get it directly from me and have me sign it, just go to uh, uh, rockoutbooks.com, R-O-C-K-O-U-T-B-O-O-K-S, rockoutbooks.com. Uh, take you right to the landing page, right for the book. You can search for it. You can search my name, Blakesburg, and blakesburg.com. I'll also take you there as well. Um, I have nothing else on my website right now. We're actually, when my daughter sort of started getting involved with me, she said, okay, time for a rebrand. We're rebranding Rockout Books. We're rebranding blakesburg.com. So we're redoing the, the website. Uh, for, for we already did the Rock Out Books website, which is just a Shopify store, um, and we're redoing Blakesburg.com now. We're we're a good a, a far way through. Now we're getting down to picking out photos and putting them into their sections and whatnot. But um, you know that's that's something my daughter is. So she works for me about half time right now, yeah. uh, 15, 20 hours a week. She's in a grad school program at Sotheby's in arts management and archival studies. Oh, excellent. And, uh, 
is doing that right now. So she'll do that for the next year and a half because I gotta, I gotta set her up for taking over my, my business and my archive. You know, it makes me scared. Like what happens to these archives when you get old or when you die, you know, a lot of stuff ends up in these, um, uh, university archives and museum archives. And a lot of this stuff just ends up in cardboard boxes and basements and nobody knows what mm -hmm. to do with it. Right? Never to be seen again. Yeah. 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 Again. That's another yeah. show. We got to do that. That's another show. Like, what do you do? Like, they, like photographers are constantly talking about, or not constantly, but a topic of conversation is, you know, back up and archive and raid this and all that. And, yeah. you know, making yeah. put this in the cloud. If it doesn't exist in three locations, it doesn't exist. Um, but very rarely do we talk about mortality. Like what right. happens to your work yeah. when you're, when you're, when you got your wings and you're heading out, right? What, what happens to all that stuff that you've left behind all those images, whether they're in the cloud, in a filing cabinet in sleeves or wherever, like where, what is your whole, that's your life's work, right? What, where does it go? That's, that's why my daughter came to me with the idea to start retro photo archive is because she's like, what are you doing with your work? You know, and I'm listen, I'm 60 years old, knock on wood. I'm here for many, many more decades. Yeah. Um, but uh, and so so she started to do some research and found some photographers that were had we'll call them dormant archives that were either sitting in shoe boxes or file cabinets or uh, a basement. Um, and there's, a, you know, there's a lot of photographers that shot in the 50s and the 60s and their families are trying to take care of it. But a lot of people don't even know how to get it out of boxes and into archival sleeves and into archival notebooks and then actually edit it and then have these scans and then have the ability to actually get it out there commercially, right? From a licensing standpoint or a fine art print standpoint. And that's what we're doing. Um, you know, it's Ricky's, Ricky's retro photo archive, you know, my, my daughter, and I'm, I'm doing it with her uh, on the technical side and helping her acquire these archives and, um, you know, sort of build this business that is, it will include my work as well because you know I don't want my stuff to disappear and there's already people and and one of the most important things for retro photo archive is that the work always always stays in the name of the photographer right mm -hmm. so we're, you know we're not we're not um, ever gonna just you know credit a photo to retro photo archive it's always going to be credited to uh, the photographer because it's their work, it's their life's work. It's got to stay in their name, and uh, and we're keeping that stuff alive. So check out the Retro Photo Archive uh, website, retrophotoarchive.com. It's 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 very cool. Coming along right now, it's just a, you know, it's a licensing uh, portal. It's not uh, a fine art print portal yet, but it's getting there. So cool, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll definitely link to all this in the the show notes for the blog post as well as the YouTube video, so folks can just click and and hop right over to it. Hey. Congratulations. You every time I talk to you, I feel like you have a million things going on, like like past, present and future. Right. You're always you're always hustling. You know, I love it. You're like the, the, the stereotypical, like, where does the energy come from photographer? Right? Right. Yeah, what, I mean, which what power source you like I mean, an Iron Man at, power source? Look right at my there? messy <laughs> office. It's, you know, we, we, we you know, we eat breathe, sleep, photography around here. We've got, Love it. you know, a whole lot of stuff going on all at once with uh, editing and scanning and archiving and, and research and licensing and printing and uh, gallery exhibits, uh, book projects. It's, uh, you know, there's a photographer here in San Francisco named Greg Gar, and uh, we're doing a, a book of his street photography from the 1970s, which is just phenomenal work. Um, and that's part of the Retro Photo Archive collection. And, you know, he's just this incredible photographer that's just nobody's really seen his stuff until now. Uh, so we've got all sorts of projects going on and, uh, you know, helping other people make books and whatnot. I have my own. I self-publish all my books. So Retro, Photo, uh, Retro Blakesburg, rather, is self-published by Rock Out Books, my company. Um, and that's my 16th coffee table book. And out of those 16, 14 of them are self-published. Uh, two of them have been with publishers. So, um yeah, we got a lot of a lot of stuff going on in the photo world. I love it. I love it. Well, congratulations on all that you do, and thank you for all that you do. We gotta. We can't let another pandemic go by before we do another interview. We can't. We can't right, have well, the pandemic as the interval. After the after the new year, we'll do another. We'll do another session. 
Yeah, cool. Yeah, because the book will be out. And I want to continue the conversation about self-publishing, too, because I know a lot of sure. photographers want to understand that world. Some some yeah. people I know are experimenting in that world, experimenting with doing self, self-published uh, Kickstarter type books and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I want to get into your brain on that. It sounds like you, sure. you know your way around that industry. So. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Thanks, Frederick. Right. Appreciate your time. And uh, cheers, everybody. See you out there. This is Twitter.